Disperse. You are ordered to disperse. This march will not continue. On Sunday, March 7, 1965, in Selma, Alabama, state and local police clubbed and tear-gassed civil rights marchers as they began the 52-mile march to Montgomery, the Alabama state capital. They were marching for the rights of African Americans who had been beaten and harassed when attempting to register to vote. Jonathan Myrick Daniels, a 25-year-old student at the Episcopal Theological Seminary in Cambridge, Massachusetts, watched the dramatic television coverage of the violent events in Selma. That evening, Jonathan heard the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. call on the Northern clergy to come to Selma and help complete the historic march to Montgomery. I attended evening prayer as usual, and as usual, I was singing the Magnificat with the special love and reverence I have always felt for Mary's glad song. I found myself peculiarly alert, suddenly straining towards the decisive, luminous, spirit-filled moment. Then it came. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble and the meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things. I knew then that I must go to Selma. Just going down for the weekend, Daniels and a classmate missed the bus back, and then began to think about how such a short trip must look like to those who lived in Selma. So the two students applied for and received permission to take study on their own in Selma and returned to seminary to take examinations. Daniels worked in literacy, poverty, and voter registration. He wrote about his experience with his anger, about the injustice he saw all around him when he and his companions were tear-gassed at a peaceful demonstration. At first... I think I should gladly have procured a high-powered rifle and taken to the woods to fight the battle as the Klansmen do. I was very angry with white people. I think it was when I got tear-gassed leading a march in Camden that I began to change. I saw that the men who came at me were themselves not free. Even though they were white and hateful and my enemy, they were human beings, too. I began to discover a new freedom in the cross, freedom to love the enemy, and in that freedom, to will and to try to set him free. I had realized that as a Christian, as a soldier of the cross, I was totally free, at least free to give my life if that had to be with joy and thankfulness and eagerness for the kingdom no longer hidden from my blind eyes. On the 20th of August, 1965, Daniels and his associates had just been released from a six-day stay in prison for picketing local businesses. The release was without bail, it was unexpected, and it was highly suspicious. When he mounted the steps to a grocery store to buy a soft drink, the group was approached by a man carrying a shotgun. And as the man pulled the trigger, Daniels stepped in front of the blast, shielding 16-year-old Ruby Sales, who had been the intended target. The death of Daniels shocked the Episcopal Church into facing the reality of racial inequality. Daniels Killer, a deputy sheriff who had a history of unprovoked violence on African Americans, was acquitted on the grounds of self-defense claiming that Daniels had assaulted him with a knife. The all-white, all-male jury looked le took less than two hours to reach a verdict. A direct result of this verdict was the reformation of the jury system throughout the South to ensure multiracial and gender participation in jury selection. Daniels was an amazing writer. He was always aware of his own complicity in racism and his own sinfulness, tempered with good humor. 
he was always able to integrate his work with the liturgical worship that empowered and invigorated him. He describes an experience at one of the Selma picket lines. After a week-long rain-soaked vigil, we still stood face-to-face with the Selma police. I stood for a change in the front rank, ankle-deep in an enormous puddle. To my immediate right were high school students, for the most part, and further to the right were a swarm of clergymen. My end of the line surged forward at one point, led by a militant Episcopal priest whose temper, as usual, was at the combustion point. Thus, I found myself only inches from a young policeman. The air crackled with tension and open hostility. Emma Jean, a sophomore in the Negro High School, called my name from behind. I reached back for her hand to bring her up to the front rank, but she did not see. Again, she asked me to come back. My determination had become infectiously savage, and I insisted that she come forward. I would not retreat. Again, I reached for her hand and pulled her forward. The young policeman spoke. You're dragging her through the puddle. You ought to be ashamed for treating a girl like that. Flushing, I had forgotten the puddle. I snarled something at him about whose fault it really was that managed to be both defensive and self-righteous. We matched baleful glances and then both looked away. And then came a moment of shattering internal quiet in which I felt shame, indeed, and a kind of reluctant love for the young policeman. I apologized to Emma Jean, and then it occurred to me to apologize to him and thank him. Though he looked away in contempt, I was not altogether sure I blamed him. I had received a blessing that I would not forget. Before long, the kids were singing. They were singing the song, I Love Blank. And one of my friends asked the young policeman for his name. His name was Charlie. When we sang for him, he blushed and then smiled in a truly sacramental mixture of embarrassment and pleasure and shyness. Soon the young policeman looked relaxed. We all lit cigarettes in a couple of instances from a common match, and small groups of kids and policemen clustered to joke or talk cautiously about the situation. It was thus a shock later to look across the rank at the clergymen and their opposites who glared across a still unbroken wall in what appeared to be silent hatred. Had I been freely arranging the order for evening prayer that night, I think I might have followed the general confession directly with the general thanksgiving or perhaps the Te Deum. For us as humans, confrontation is inevitable. But as Christians, Hate is never an option. And we see two different modes of confrontation in this single experience of Daniel's from Selma. The one that's probably more familiar with us is the one of the clergymen and the police facing each other with open hostility, each sticking to their viewpoint, unable to give away any sign that they might recognize the humanity on the other side. This is pretty much the norm at how our society handles conflict. The images of the Marlboro Man, the Cowboy, the Ford Truck Man, implies that the way to handle conflict is to state your position and fight until you prevail. Looking at our politics, whether state or church today, it's easy to see that model repeated over and over. But what about the other model of confrontation from Daniel Selma account? The policeman becomes more than a nameless policeman. He becomes Charlie. The children sing that they love him. The barriers break down, the lines dissolve, and the wall falls. Now, I don't believe that either the protesters or the policemen actually changed their views of the civil rights movement in this encounter. But something is changed. They all become real people to each other rather than just stereotypes. Because it's much easier to hate a stereotype than a real person. In the epistle today we hear, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Throughout the epistles, Paul's focus is more about how to handle conflict than what the outcome of that conflict should be, because his insight as a pastor is that conflict itself can be the most vexing problem that the church faces, that it tends to put us in polarized camps. It tempts us to judge the other who disagrees with us, and in the Gospels we are cautioned that judgment is God's prerogative alone. Because when we judge, we see the other as a stereotype, not a person. 
But what we come to understand in both Paul and our story from Daniel's is that when you are in conflict with a person, it is vitally important that you get to know them personally, to hear their stories, to get to know their joys and struggles. Your opinion may not change, but you're less likely to pass judgment on a particular someone you admit as a fellow human being loved by God, and you'll be less likely to fall into the sin of judging. As Christians, the way we treat our fellow human beings is the primary way that people decide on the truth of our message. Therefore, as Paul said, we are to be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In 1991, Jonathan Daniels was designated as a martyr of the Episcopal Church, and August 14th, this Friday, was set as his Remembrance Day. He and Martin Luther King Jr. are the two Americans commemorated in the Chapel of the Martyrs at Canterbury Cathedral in England. This year is the 50th anniversary of his martyrdom, and Daniel's likeness is being carved near the entrance to the National Cathedral. Daniel's was an imitator of God, and that while he was angered with the injustice he saw all around him, he was still able to see the humanity of his enemies. Being able to love your enemies, he said, was the true measure of freedom. That's why we pray for those we consider to be our enemies every Sunday morning. Not so that they may change to our views or that we change to their views or even that we come to agreement, but that we may continue to see our commonality being made in the image of God as the lowest common denominator of who we are. Because our ultimate freedom is allowing Christ to free us from the hate that blinds us. Amen.